welcome to another series of Ben Wagon Roundtable, and today we're discussing making a living as an artist in the digital age. Uh, today we have a really good group of people. I'm your host, Inch Tra, a singer-songwriter as well as founder of Invasion Singapore. On my left, we have Kevin Fu, founder and managing director of, uh, oh, sorry, producer and studio owner of Beep Studios. Yep. Sorry. Oh, uh, Simon Sal, founder and managing director of Simon Sal Law Corporation, as well as Clarence Chan, founder of Bandwagon today. Say hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Uh, so I, before we started, I had an opening question, which was what are the three main qualities that you look for in an artist that you kind of find that attra you're attracted to an artist more than anything else? Kevin? He starts first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm closest to the lady. Um, well, for me, it's always about the song. Mm. So it's about um, the lyrical content, the emotions attached to it, the melody. It's, it's the music first. The music. I guess I am I'm biased towards that because music is, is the main thing for me. Um, reason why I'm doing this. Yep. Yeah, I think genuine attraction to the music, I think, is the first mm. consideration. Sometimes you might hear something on the radio and it attaches you and then you then go and figure out who this person is. Mm. So then the person, once you found out the person, I think the looks whether this person looks compelling or non compelling, rather than whether this person looks good or not good, I think is a consideration. And a back a good backstory would be helpful. If it adds to mm. the personality of the artist. Mm. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think we all have favorite genres, so definitely the music itself is really important. Um, I mean, as owner of a media platform, I think how you market the music is, is equally important. Mm. You know, how you dress on stage, your showmanship, how people see you live, um, the artwork you produce, and being even creative in terms of how you market yourself. I think these are very important things. Mm. I guess the story of the artist as well is something that compelling, especially when you want to have um, create a fan loyalty. Mm. When people appreciate the story of how you came to be, what what drive your songs, mm. I think that really helps in building that affinity with the artist and what keeps me as a loyal fan of artists that I like. Cool. Yeah, so I think it's a great thing that all of us here kind of put the music first above everything else, and that's awesome. So just to get the audience to get to know everybody, because we kind of know what we all do, but to discover everybody's personality, we have about a spitfire questions to ask you. <laughs> so it's very quick questions that you can only answer as fast as you can. Oh yeah. All right. Okay, we'll try. Slippers or sandals? Um, sandals. Slippers or sandals? None. None. <laughs> <laughs> do I get a none choice? <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, you can. Slippers or sandals? Slippers definitely Slippers. easier to wear. Okay, true or dare? Dare. True. true. There. Lawyers <laughs> well, is true. Yeah. 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 Just the no yeah. Call or text. Good thing you said true. What? Call or text. Uh, call text. or text. Oh, call <laughs> or text. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say text? Like, what? Call or text. Call. Text. Call. Okay. Um, spicy food, non spicy food. Non spicy. Non spicy. Spicy. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we can swap spicy. this right now. Yeah, we can swap <laughs> this right now. Uh, bright colors or neutral tones? Earthy tones. Earthy tones. Dark colors for me. Dark yeah, colors. Dark no colors. colors. Like, Don't love you, you have a pink yeah. suit. Oh yeah. You can Not splash. today. <laughs> Roller coaster or Ferris wheel? Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel. Roller coaster. Okay. Ocean That's sickness, awesome. man. Stuck in traffic or causing the traffic? Causing the traffic. Causing, causing the traffic. The traffic. Yeah. With my pink suit. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay, so if you guys were all stuck listening to one genre for the rest of your life, what would it be? Classical for me. If it was for the rest of my life, that's it would be for good. eternity, right? Eternity. It would have to be gospel. <laughs> hey, oh, that's good. Good choice. Good choice. Uh, jazz for me. Jazz. Okay, awesome. So I guess we get to know our panelists today. So I guess we get into the hardier stuff today. Um, a lot of people don't know what the difference between a record label, a management, and an agent is. Like, what do you? What are your thoughts on that? Is there a difference even in Singapore? Because we seem to be such a Falkaleo nation. But what do you guys think about that? Like defining these different roles. Kevin, you should go. Okay. Yeah. Well, to to me, like the the reason why Falkaleo is simply because there's not that much money to be made. The industry is, is still a fledgling industry, and that's why a lot of people end up doing everything. So the manager comes in and realizes, that, oh, I've also got to be the agent. I'm the booking agent. I'm, you know, I'm doing the PR. I'm also handling the recorded music. But they are actually all, all very different roles. Yep. So a record label, to me, which is what I think I have a passion for, 
it's about the recorded music, um, about how you monetize it, how you how you push it out to you know, different uh, territories for people to consume it, how you dress it up a little bit, how you work with your, your PR agencies, your PR campaigns to just get the music to people who would appreciate it and listen to it. What do you think, Samuel? I think um, <clears throat> we are very powerful now, as you said. Yeah. And, but slowly, I, I, I start seeing things take shape. Mm. So finally, we have like indie record labels that, that finally know what they're doing. And understanding that uh, ownership of a song is quite different from ownership of the recording that embodies the song. You know, and I think that kind of distinction, once people are clear about it, it it's amazing for me that we have an entire music industry that doesn't quite clearly know who to go to for different functions. Yeah. And mm. legally, our musicians don't seem to care and they just want to make their music and they don't care about how to make money from the music. I think creative people have their space, but I think that the role of managers is to teach them how to take care of their stuff. The role of the record label is of course to push the sound recording. The role of the publishers would be to push the, the compositions and the lyrics. And these distinctions must make clear. But until that's made clear, we will continue with Falcon now and not really making a lot of money. Yeah. What do you think, Clarence? Um, I think these days, totally agree with both of them. We see uh, amalgamation, you know, where um, people take on multiple roles. Um, I think as much as creating the music is important, um, understanding who owns the works is increasingly important. And this is so as we see more Singaporean acts who are um, breaking out overseas. You know, have likes of Gentle Bones, uh, Lin Ying, of which Kevin produced. And um, you know, they're getting millions of streams on air. And you know, who owns these things? And one of the reasons why we started this series and we got such an esteemed panel, including yourself, it's because we realized that um, people weren't educated about these things and um, you know there were some misunderstandings when it came to who owns the rights for different things and um, so we appreciate this panel and that's the whole purpose and I hope today um, we really clarify these roles and how everyone can come together to support the music and make us more than a scene and move towards an industry. So yeah. what's the benefit of seeing all of these roles separately and as together like that? I'm sure they both have their pros and cons, it being yeah. Pakaleo and everybody having their individual you see, when people specialize, I think people get better mm. at what they do. For so sure. a record label, if they if they concentrate on, on mark, marketing the sound recording, then it becomes easier to identify who to go to when you're looking to license sound recordings. Mm. Publishers have been around for a long time. Mm. So these publishers and the big guys that have been around, they will do their stuff. You know, so if you want to go in and play in their playground, it is to your own devastation. Mm. And for managers, I think, we need to have better managers in Singapore, for musicians especially, mm. um, because no one seems to know how to properly market musicians within our little environment here. Yep. And yep. most of the time, uh, people who do well, do well in Taiwan or Hong Kong, mm. because there are better managers there who know the industry there. So we need to create an industry here where there are places to sell to, mm. and then the managers know how to sell. So you think managers is the first step? getting a good management team before we talk about the other building um, blocks? I think the publishers are already there. Um, managers need to know how to manage musicians and people around need to support the fact that having like an artist having a manager is something to be expected and not something that will cause the artist to lose jobs. Because there are people who like to bully artists and they will know that if you have a manager, they will not want oh, to do it. You know, so I think that kind of culture needs to stop. As an artist, what do you think, Inch? Happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I do feel like all three roles are pretty important as well. Like, uh, and I mean, I was in the States for a while, so I got to be able to see how the functionality of when everyone starts to specify their Mm -hmm. roles pretty well. Um, But yeah, management, I agree. I think out of all of these three things need to come first. Uh, because uh, your manager is not just in charge of your short-term goals but your long-term yeah. career as an mm-hmm. artist so they're the ones that are coaching that for a long time and a great example is you two like their manager was was crazy they took their money and invested in real estate basically was trying to make the, the band sustainable mm-hmm. on their own and it, it's quite interesting there's so many different kinds of management as well out there so my question back to all of you guys is how long do you think it would take a, like how far are we from actually being able to have diverse, diverse type roles like that, you know? How, how far along is Singapore, you know? Well, from, okay, from my experience, what, what we've been doing, we start out with just whole idealistic look at, there's great talent here, 
we want to, you know, we want to work with some of these individuals who maybe have um, ha hasn't been signed by the majors or anything, and um, we try to do everything. But along the way, you realize that time is a big factor as well. I mean, specializing is definitely the, the way to go. But also, if I'm going to do everything, I can't possibly be mm. looking for um, ways to sell your song or get you know, your, get the, the IP of your song um, pushed in, you know, for sync or something. And yeah. at the same time, still manage you as an artist, mm. finding opportunities for you, mm. um, fighting you know, or, or negotiating better deals for you. So that's when, like with Foundation Music, we have started to work with people who are specializing. Mm. So we are, even though we sign an artist, we will sign off like with a sub-label. We have a sub-label in Japan, P-Vine for the Steve mm. McQueen's, and Splash Blue in the UK and US. And for Linning also, we just signed a deal for, for the US and UK. So these guys are there and they are you know on the ground and they know the markets there well. Yeah. Um, I agree with Samuel. Management in Singapore has also been because you know we are still trying to figure out um, the consumer habits here in Singapore. Mm. So like, there's a, a lot more people paying money to kind of check out cover bands or listen listening to cover music. And um, are there ways of you know monetizing the original artists here in Singapore? Is what's the best way of doing so, um, or at least doing it to a to a level where it is it's actually viable or sustainable? Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's important to specialize. Um, we are just on the way. We're not there yet, I think, personally. But would you think that one of the reasons why there aren't so many managers is because it's, it's tough to make it, it make it a living tough. as a manager? I mean, Inge, you probably know, maybe you could share some thoughts about, I mean, is it sustainable? I mean, do we have full-time managers in Singapore and, you know? I think we do have full-time managers, but I mean, depending on what the audience wants, the kind of work that they can deliver so far. At least from an indie, indie point, of, uh, point of view, like, House of Riot is, uh, I mean, my opinion, Eugenie, they work in Sarah is the day-to-day -day manager, she's full-time on this. So, like, yeah, uh, there is possibilities for it too, but then when you talk about make a living, like how well of a well living, living are yeah. you making for yourself? I don't know, Sammy, what do you think? Like, how long are we away from You see, too? I also own an artist management company. Yes, mm. me. Yep. Yes. Yep. Mm. Uh, and it has, it has been around for a couple of years. Mm. Um, the landscape has changed a lot since we mm. first started. You know, when we first started, it was hard to even as an um, artist to make a living. Yeah. But now, even being itself is finding it easier and easier to like monetize. Okay. And you know, so artists are easier to market now because people realize now brands want to align themselves with particular artists or particular even songs, you know, that, that, that carry the, the character of that brand. Mm -hmm. So I think when people start realizing that social media is very important and the character of the song or the character of the person can bring along their product or their service to the rest of the consumer public, mm -hmm. I think it becomes easier and easier to sell. So today Beam is making money, I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yay. Great job. Yeah. Money. <laughs> awesome. yeah, no. money. But that's, that's, that's not important. the end game though. No. Of course mm -hmm. not. Yeah. The mm -hmm. end game I think everyone needs to know is we all need to respect Singapore music, Singapore art. Singapore culture mm. because a lot of our people uh, still think that outside things are better yeah. and honestly we have very good theatre we have very good music just have to listen mm. yeah you just really have to give it a chance because we are the only Southeast Asian market to my knowledge that doesn't consume local music more than they consume foreign More music enough, yeah. and that really smacks to me as a lack of pride I agree mm. Mm. Yeah. do you think that language has a as a part to play in that. I mean, like other regional markets like Malaysia, Indonesia, they have their own native languages. Mm. But Singapore, we have our own, own native language as well. Um, but our languages, like Chinese songs will do very well, too, mm. for example. You know, then English songs, for them continually not to be doing well is a bit of a mystery for me. Mm. Considering the majority of us actually yes, speak English, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm, it is a bit of a mystery. Yeah. But the fact that I guess we are, you know, Beam is slowly being able to monetize our music's easily exported these, yeah. days, these days. I think it's quite hopeful that, yep. like, yes, you know, I think absolutely. we're on Very our soon, way I think. Yep. to yeah. diversifying to these different roles and creating a bigger industry. So, if, as an artist, right, like, since management is like one of the most important things, right, not to look for first, but um, what should an artist look for? Like I'm a new artist and I'm like I, I need management. What should I be looking for? Or how should I look, go about looking for it? You know. You're looking at me, right? Yeah, I guess. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. Or any, all of you guys, you know. 
I think um, you need to look for someone who is doing it for the passion of it and not doing it for the money. Because music doesn't make money. Mm. But artists also need to remember that music doesn't make money. So if you want to do music and you want to do esoteric music that no one's going to listen to, then you better be happy not earning a lot of money. Yeah. Right? But if you want to like pander to consumerism and pander to what people want, then you need to know what the market requires of you and you need a, a manager who can bring you to where the market requires you to go to. Mm-hmm. And that manager must know enough people within that little industry to make all these roads meet for you. And I don't think we have that level of manager for musicians yet. Mm-hmm. You're right. I mean, at Powder, so look at the landscape, there really is you were to compare the amount of artists to the amount of managers, it's really yeah. quite lopsided. Mm. What do you think, Kevin? Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I agree with um, Clarence when he said that um, it's just been hard for these managers to, to do this full time in, in a viable way. Yeah. So it seems like sometimes the, the rational or, um, or logical thing to do is send volume. You, you manage many artists and then, you know, you get income from every one of these artists. Um, and you try to make it sustainable, but that in, it, in itself becomes a problem because yeah, it's a big, yeah, big problem. it becomes a big problem, right? Yeah. So that's why, I mean, from my observation with, with the people I know who have chosen to do management for a little while, they go through this, a similar route. They start doing quite a lot with one. They realize that I better, you know, expand my um, my group of artists, and then you realize that they can't actually put in the same amount of effort to each one of them, mm-hmm. and so. That doesn't answer the question actually, right? It boils down back to... Yeah. But you know, there are, there are managers who sign on a lot of people mm. and then the others don't work. When the mm. others don't work, mm. and maybe 10 out of 100 work, mm. the rest of the 90 will be cursing at you the whole yep. day. Mm. You know, because artists are emotional to start with. And when they don't get work, they get extra emotional. Right. So if you want to, I think, find a management that concentrates on you and just a few others, so that's power teaming rather yep. than like just sign on everyone and then the manager makes money perhaps mm. but the artist don't yeah, yeah I mean I'm, I'm definitely on, I completely agree with you guys because like for me well look, I've came across a lot of different kinds of managers over the years and I've got share shady ones as well of course I think it's a rite of passage if you're an artist that you are going to meet in your lifetime at least one or two shady no. managers how shady yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like oh where's the money no idea just disappear oh, to thin right, air right. kind of who don't understand you as an artist as well and I think that's important like they need to try to not I mean it's important to give suggestions and mold it but they intrinsically need to understand who you are as an artist mm. and on top of that like for well, at least for proof is in the pudding in terms of House of Riot for me mm. like Mike only pretty much has only ever managed three artists in his lifetime mm. and he first started out with Great Spy for like six years followed by Charlie and myself for like the last four years and he hasn't expanded and had no intention of expanding and which honestly I felt, I mean, I feel treasured as an artist, you know, because mm-hmm. like, you know, there was, it seems like I felt a lot of attention was given to me, or yeah. even though all, they are still already very busy with the other two yeah. artists as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's above all, mm-hmm. personally, it's not about who can get you where you want to be, uh, but who do you want to be with when you get there. Yes, yeah. because you cannot depend only on the managers to get your jobs, Absolutely. right? Some, some artists also get lazy. And then you sign up with someone and you half expect them to get everything for you yeah. and you, you don't get anything for yourself. I think that also is not right. Yeah. And I think that's a misconception that a lot of artists have as well, right? Like yeah. the moment you get a manager... The then manager does everything. And yeah. you're supposed to do everything, yeah. which is yeah. completely a lie. A manager is not an agent. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So that's the difference. So what's the difference? Maybe you could explain to some of our, mm. our audience that... A manager watches you, watches your imaging and makes sure that you have a long-term kind of plan as to where you want to get to. An agent is engaged by managers to get you jobs so they're like bookers mm. so i think in more mature industries they have that distinction mm. but in singapore we only have management who also plays the booker role yeah. and i don't think that is conducive that that is something that that can be done mm-hmm. so even being ourselves we look for other people to help us find jobs for our artists and, and we'll pay them commissions along the way mm-hmm. so so that that industry is changed because we actively wanted to change mm. I definitely see that distinction being really important because most of the time your bookers don't care about the trajectory of the artist. They're no. just trying to book as many shows yeah. as they can. So 
So I think it's your manager to fight whether what's in brand and, yep. and what, what stays the same. So moving on to like, I guess this is booking your shows and going on to the other side of monetization, which is the music the itself. Thing, right. Like in the digital age of streaming now, I'm sure you guys get this question a lot now. How does distribution for royalties work? I think Sammy would know best about this. Don't stop asking me questions. You all better ask. It's the reason why you're in the middle. Like, Hello. Yeah, I mean, like everyone's mm. talk about all this like low percentage of royalties, and I mean, like, it goes to Kevin too because like Linying has been such a huge success, and mm. you know she's like a number one globally as well. So like, I, I mean, how have you seen? Have you seen the returns? What do you feel comfortable talking about all of this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to tell you, I was we were um, really pleasantly surprised because um, we get our our royalty reports like a quarter after everything happens, yeah. right? So um, things started blowing up. They were still seeing the money. It was like, oh, okay, you know, it didn't result too much. But one quarter later, then you realize, oh, actually, it's it's quite a substantial amount for in an unprecedented way for an English speaking artist coming out of Singapore. And yeah, um, we we have then tried to steward that properly. To make sure that the, we continue with you know with that rise and to, to make sh- um, more partnerships in the, in the right direction and focusing on the right territories as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so monetization, if you're talking about it now, for digital music comes either from streaming on all the different streaming platforms. Once you sign up with them, um, either through an aggregator or you can you know do it indie, go CD Baby or TuneCore, put it up there. Mm-hmm. Um, you will agree to a certain amount of money per stream. Then there's also digital downloads, whether it's on uh, Amazon Music or iTunes, um, and you get paid per download. Mm. So working those numbers, it's it's very small amounts, and I guess the only way that it's become or it's becoming more and more viable is just in volume, more people buying it, more people streaming or listening to it. So yeah. Kevin, for Lin Ying, I think the question for a lot of artists is like, what got her there? Because obviously, I mean, it's a great song, right? Yep. That goes without saying. I mean, what got her to that level where she cracked the global top 50 Spotify charts and you're talking about a viable income? I mean, yeah. if you could share more about that. You'd love to great. say us, la, but actually the truth, <laughs> is, <laughs> the, the truth is, now, firstly, it's the song. Mm-hmm. And I mean, a, a lot of people don't know this, I think, but the song actually went up online three months before it blew up. So it, it wasn't like, it went up there and then suddenly everybody like, oh, it's amazing. Um, there was a lot of uh, PR work behind it as well. So just trying to plug the songs and get plug the song, getting it to the right curators, getting it to the right blogs. Um, and it really helped that she was identified as a Spotify artist for 2016. Um, I think most Spotify offices around the world will try to partner with, you know, just locally and territorially people that they can push for that. And a lot of it after was organic. So once we got it to a I guess to a platform where people were listening mm-hmm. and curators started taking it and putting it into their playlists. You know, she was put into a UK Spotify playlist of most beautiful songs in the world, right up there wow. with, with her idols, yeah, like with the people that she really loved. Wow. And she then from there just went on to Spotify playlists in the Netherlands, in um, in, in Scandinavia, in Taiwan, mm-hmm. and all these things adds, adds up. So you know, markets, individual territories that just pick it up. Yeah. Very nice. So I think that's the cool thing about like the digital age, right? Like curate, like now everyone, especially for Spotify, they have their own curate curatorial teams, yeah. and it really does allow the work to speak yeah. in that sense. You know, where if, if it's good work, someone will curate it in, and playlists is really the way to go for Spotify. Mm-hmm. If you have your songs in a couple of playlists, it could really kind of snowball yeah, itself pretty mm-hmm. well. Um, but I guess like that that comes with a re- the relationship with Spotify as well, the PR of the blog, but other than mm-hmm. comments, which a good management would yeah. help negotiate because it would be weird if the artists did it themselves. Mm-hmm. Artists should never negotiate for yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's rather to some level, you know, it's wrong to price yourself, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. and sometimes if someone disagrees with your price, it's, it feels bad for them to disagree with your price when it's you talking yeah. to them about the price. <laughs> so that's why managers, I think, are useful. But artists must use managers um, carefully. But, yeah. So I mean, Clarence, since you like, you know, you um, Ben Wang is known such a great media side. Um, what is like even when you feature an artist and stuff like that? Because I guess maybe this is where, as a cur- like someone that curates material yeah. as well, yeah. what do you look for then when it comes to your like, you know, for an yeah. artist? Well, um. Well, for starters, I would say that uh, the curatorial role at Bandwagon is done by my editors. Mm. Um, but as Chip I see me. what they, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't me. But yeah. as I see what they look out for, a lot of it is uh, uniqueness in the music. Mm. Yep. You'll be surprised how much of the music sounds very samey, 
you know. Um, maybe it's because it's the same references or people are following trends. So it all comes sounds the same after a while. But in general, um, at Bandwagon, we like to look for new sounds, unique sounds, um, ones that are original. You know, they come from maybe a place of experience, you know, like yourself when you did that Ubin thing, you know, we thought that was really unique and we wrote about that as well. Mm. Yeah, so um, musicians who are just going beyond what, you know, people usually hear and create something that excites people. So as a platform, you know, we look for that. At the same time, um, you know, we get a lot of people writing in every day. So what definitely helps are two things. Uh, one, you know, you have someone who, like a management, who helps to push these um, uh, art, artists and these albums. Mm -hmm. So these are people who bother building relationships with my editors so that when a good track is released, you know, they can reach out in a more personal manner. And that usually helps when you have that trust with uh, the person from the label. Yeah. And he recommends you and say, hey, this is something good. Um, you know, as, as humans, we definitely do, in a sense, um, care about you know uh, personal recommendations yeah. as well from people you trust mm -hmm. so that's uh, often important uh, persistence is also equally important <laughs> you know sometimes people send once they didn't get picked up they get pissed off next time they meet you at the gig they don't want to talk to you i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah it's crazy. you know right samuel yeah. that these kind of people yeah. so um persistence is really important i mean i heard this story i think it was in universal in the us and how like every time after you drop off your record every time you call them to remind them whether they have heard it they'll put it into a second basket and then you call again, you put it in the third basket. And it's only after you reach the fifth basket that they'll hand it to the A&R guys to listen. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's the kind that's of... Sorry. Because there's so many people, um, you know, who have good music, who are kind of trying to put it out there. Mm. So after a while, while talent is valued, they also find importance in persistence. Mm. And I think that's really important for artists or their management to bear in mind as well. Mm. Mm. So, okay, so it seems like everybody here is very pro-streaming. What, what about you, Samuel? Are you... How do you feel about streaming in general? And you being honest, like mm. if it's if it's. I think streaming is certainly better than people downloading illegally, which was the case before. Mm. Um, however, I I agree with Taylor Swift. Okay. No, no, <laughs> that no. you know sometimes this, this but by I suppose it's inevitable if people have, the the powers that that be have chosen this as the modus of which music needs to be now distributed. We we can't fight it, mm. but. Um, I, I think unless you stream a lot of times, you don't really make a lot of money from it at all. Yeah. Right? So, right now, I think in the digital, but the digital age brings with it the possibility of people streaming your song many, many, many times. So when, when, when that happens, then I suppose if you get paid per stream, it makes sense. But otherwise, if people listen to you, then it becomes very important that your song becomes unique. And uniqueness may be sometimes um, disguised by gimmicks, you know, and I think gimmicks should not be what makes a song good, but it's a different world now, so it, it really depends on the consumer to decide what kind of music they eventually will that's like. That's true. Mm. Yeah, because, okay, that's really, really cool, because, like, I, I think uh, I'm pro-streaming as well, because I guess we're becoming into a more pro-consumer world in general, and I think if that's how the consumers would like to consume, I guess it's a numbers game. Yeah, it's the a number. End of it all, uh, and it's also reach, I think, for me. Mm. Like digitally or street or streaming really gets you to places that there's no way yeah, internationally. Yeah. I, I can't push a CD there, I can't get the physicals yeah. there, I can't do any PR there. So if you were to give any advice or, or when you guys handle your own artists as well, would would you be a more pro streaming approach right now or would you be more like traditional, still sell albums and stuff? Like what approach we offer to the take on this in the landscape now? Yeah. For me, it's case by case because, um, like, I just um, mixed a, a, a local band mm. that does like old school rock and roll with mandolin and banjo and stuff like that, and they know that they're Cheating target. Sense. No, uh, no, generally. Yeah. Generally, sorry. Uh, yeah, generally. but um, yeah, guys from a bunch of different bands came together to the original stuff, um, and I think that their market, their, their targeted. Um, audience is still predominantly physical, you know, people who listen to CDs or even vinyls. So I think they are they're considering that, that direction. Um, yeah, but like people at Linning, um, even even the Steve McQueens, the, their music is being consumed really by people in, in, in different countries that listen to them digitally. Yeah, so we are not really sure if we should really press vinyl for them, or, mm. although there's a vinyl resurgence, you know, stuff yes. like that. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with that, that, you know, for most 
people now who are, who are trying to attract the young demographic CDs. I don't even know where to buy a CD yeah. from now, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in Singapore, it's really tough. So I, yeah. I maybe have to go to Malaysia to buy one, <laughs> uh, which I did. <laughs> but is it real or not? <laughs> uh, that I don't know. But I, 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 I lawyer only by real. <laughs> no, but, but the thing is, we also need to look at other ways to, to monetize. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you have a movie, or if you have a TV series, you know, it's important that they also have music in the background. So if a manager knows the producers really well and um, then sell them to synchronize the songs within a, a movie, it could it could hit really well. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. yeah, so so that could be a new way of, of like monetizing as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, I mean I agree with um, both Simon and Kevin uh, about streaming. At the same time, in from a business perspective, because that's what I look into at Bandwagon. I guess it's also um, a tough business model. I mean, mm -hmm. you see Spotify and uh, Deezer, which recently tried to IPO, and, and you can see their financials. Um, it's all in the red, you know. Right now, you know, Spotify just raised one billion of debt. So, and, and at one hand, artists are clamoring for more um, royalties. At the same time, labels are also trying to extract as much as possible. So it does put them in quite a tough uh, situation. And the key for every business is whether you know it could be sustainable. Uh, so I think that's going to be the challenge. Um, that on the larger scheme of things, in a more macro sense, we're going to see over the next. I mean, in the next decade, as to whether these things can sustain and whether you know, there's a need to either increase prices or find other ways. You know, while Spotify has been, um, you know, doing ads, I think ads are also nowadays much tougher. You know, in terms of monetizing, people don't mind listening to ads. Um, you know, in return for it being free. But at the same time, ad dollars are also you know drying up. When the economy is bad, first thing they cut is marketing. So you see, there's there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. So it remains to be seen really um, how sustainable. Uh, Streaming can streaming be. Yeah, but yeah. obviously, as a digital platform like Bandwagon, you know, we hope it continues because it's a great way for us to, as you said, find out about different kinds of music that we otherwise may not, you know, um, be able to access. Yeah, be able to access, and um, it helps us to present um, a, wide, a greater variety of music to our audiences. Quite easily. As mm, well, yeah, right? very easily. Because of the embedding and stuff yeah. makes it so much easier. Mm -hmm. So, back to what Samuel talked about licensing movies and stuff mm. like that. That's, I think, really interesting. So, back to the whole thing in Singapore, at least. I mean, do you recommend, or do you guys think you should get a publisher to help you start licensing stuff to films, or can a manager do that themselves? Should artists look for managers with that capability and all that stuff? There's always value, right? Like, oh, my song's in the movie, my song's in the TV show, that adds so much mileage to the artist as well. You see, the thing about publishing is it's very legally technical. Mm. It's a very technical thing. Mm. And for within publishing itself, there are synchronization rights, there are mechanical rights, there are online rights, there are all sorts of different sheet music rights, there are all mm. types of rights. And it would be very tough for a person who revolves around the music scene to legally understand these notions. So that's why publishers are important. But there, there's a difference between an OP and an SP. I think we all know the difference, but yeah. the original no, publisher... Let's break you it don't, down. Yeah, let's break let's it down. Break this it is down. a 101, Samuel. Yeah. <laughs> you should do this as a solo piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just him and me the whole time. <laughs> so, okay, my class. OP is an original publisher. That means it's the small local publisher mm. that you sign on with. So this OP, usually then, because they don't have powers beyond um, the jurisdiction they, 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 they are in, they will sign on with an SP, which is usually a big guy like Warner Chapel or like EMI or Sony, yep. so or Universal. Oh, yeah. So when they sign on with these people, then the SP, theoretically, every time the, the, the work is, is used any part in any part of the world, the money will be taken, they will take their cut, they will then send it to the OP, who is your original publisher, who only dwells in uh, works and exploits your songs within your jurisdiction, and then he takes his cut, and then it then comes to you like after two middle people along yes, the way. Two, two middle people. And traditionally, that's how it's been working. Mm, okay. Yeah. So publishers and managers are two different people, unless your manager is smart enough to be able to negotiate these legal minefields, which, which are all around. Which you would be, right? Yeah, well, theoretically, yeah. I'm just thinking maybe I should be doing it. <laughs> 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 no, you just gave him an idea. <laughs> 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 awesome. Um, so, um, are you all familiar with Hack Machine? Yep. Hack Machine? Am I the only person who doesn't know this? Oh, no, uh, it's quite new. Uh, Hack Machine. Is it an X Men? Uh, <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's a web platform and port portal, and for some of you guys who don't know what Hack Machine is, it's a website that aggregates all music, music blogs. blogs. Yeah. So music blogs now are like a great way for a lot of people 
people to kind of discover music, and it has been a good way for a lot of people to discover music. So it's like a, it's like the billboard for music blogs, you know, in some in some sense. So how relevant do you think um, Hype Machine is, or how much can it help? Because I've got my start as well from Hype Machine. So like in 2000 and I think uh, nine, that's when my album actually got into top three for Hype Machine, and then that's how yes. <laughs> <laughs> So then, like, Sapphire got interested and a lot of other people, so I got a lot more vocal traction that way. Um, to me, I love Hype Machine, but, like, how how much do y'all think it's relevant today? Because how much <coughs> can you still navigate around the industry without mm. knowing what Hype Machine is and stuff? Yeah. Well, I think to me, Hype Machine is, um, we treat it more like an exposure platform than anything mm. else, because okay. monetization, once again, becomes a question mark there. It's true. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's, it's unlike... Um, Billboard or many other charts that look at sales or you know look at um, number of requests you know or popularity in that sense. So um, one one thing that's interesting about Hype Machine though is the fact that a lot of artists are now premiering like a track or you know a remix or the entire album on a, on a Hype Machine blog. Yeah. Which means that if somebody goes onto their blog to listen to it, there's no form of monetization at all. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it follows that influencer model, it's right? Influencer like, model, like yeah. a version of it in music and blogs. How do you feel about that whole this whole new influencer movement in general? You think in my generation, <laughs> when people wanted to like, drop songs, right? They could drop them like um, in like on radios. They would drop them on yeah, TV. You know, so this is like the new way of new way to debut. Mm. The, the the difficulty is, but last time when. <laughs> the videotape time, right, when VHS, when someone was singing a song and I particularly liked the song, I would wait for the song to be played and I would videotape it and I would listen to it over and wow. over again. Right? So that was the old fashioned method. Don't wow me, right? You don't know this at all. No, I'm sorry. Okay, so piracy. So it, 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 <laughs> <laughs> for okay. personal use. No, personal use. Okay, no, okay. actually, it still was. Okay. <laughs> no, but for high virtue. <laughs> And, and things yeah, like this. The, the issue is they can listen to it over and over again. And as a result of that listening over and over again, they may not buy. Mm. Or they may not... Um, but buying doesn't matter anymore because then streaming matters. Mm. So it all kind of makes sense if streaming was the modus, if Hype Machine would go in and also provide a different way of streaming. It's just that Hype Machine, when they stream, perhaps some kind of um, money must be paid to the artist as well. Mm. Okay, that's a good way to look at it. Because I think that's the problem. I love the methods of streaming and stuff like that. But it does have somehow devalued music a little bit in some sense. Where, like, you know, when you talk about how it's like the old school way of doing it, where you would wait for yes. a song, like you're more emotionally yeah. even invested in it. So I don't know whether the new way of doing it was sort of cultivating a good, like, like listening culture. Like, we're not sort of educating the audience as well as we used. I think people tend to forget how much time it takes to make a track, even mm. though it was a crappy track, right, in your opinion. <laughs> even if it was crappy, many people would have invested time and effort into the creation of that yeah, piece. That's true. And respect needs to be paid for that. Mm. Mm. Alright, to sum it up, if anyone out there who wants to be just like you guys in the future, what advice would you give them? Go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the same advice I would give as well. You should, you should, yeah, the legalities of things would really help you mm. if you want to approach this as a business. And not just like, I like to make music, I want to put it out there. It's a whole, it's a whole different thing if you want to make a viable career out of this. You need to know your, the, legal, the, legal, the legalities around it, the business, the models and stuff like that. So we shall have a talk up. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Changing cards, I think, yeah. What about you, Clarence? Um, well, for me, I mean, my hope is that, um, you know, beyond the music, we have people from other skill sets, like, you know, the legal trade, the business trade, um, who, you know, traditionally may not consider music as a viable mm -hmm. career. You know, to take the plunge and just to do it, I guess it has to start from passion, but at the same time, bringing together your skill set to value add our industry, mm -hmm. because I think that's something that we really need to move forward. You know, in Singapore, it's having people from other complementary areas that that the music needs mm -hmm. to help us to help bring it forward. And so that's uh, my hope and my advice for anyone who feels like starting anything in music, be it uh, a competitor of bandwagon or anything else, um, you know, just do it. Can I say something? Yes, please. Okay, Beam has just signed a joint venture agreement with Universal Music. So we are helping to um, bring Universal artists into other, ter um, into other territories as well as other platforms, including acting and hosting and all that, mm. so that we can have more holistic artist mm. management services mm -hmm. together. So um, look out for more news in that. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. 
yeah so that's the thing about like i was gonna add like i think the takeaway for me personally as an artist listening to most of these experts here uh is is that beyond music i think it's good to kind of reach out to other markets as well and try to think about more who we may be licensing in movies and music because that, that in living in a digital age it's so easy for the content to cross be cross promoted and the only way to do that as well is to just anchor itself in the real content itself so it'd be able to do great interesting and if you're a young artist manager out there or someone that's inspired to do something new to work with young new artists and stuff like that, I think work with people that you believe in first in their music and then secondly, equip yourself with law. Yeah. Every, the know-hows which are really, really important for you to navigate and especially because the digital age is so new, everyone as well, even probably us, are still feeling around it because no one really knows what this new beast is going to be like. We're still waiting on what, what Spotify would look like in the next three to five years as well. So it's really about honing all the skill sets that you need to know to be able to understand everything in the future. So I'd like to kind of thank as well, lo and behold, Lufa for having us here today. Yeah, Please yes. subscribe, like and comment on Bangwens TV's channel and stay tuned for the next episode of Bandwagon Roundtable. According to Vijesh, uh, to, uh, actually it's quite easy 